If I could have the next panel, go ahead and join me on stage along with Ellen Connick, who I will introduce. When we had our national conference last year and we were looking at marketing and promotion, I was checking out some of my friends in Catholic media and assuming everyone lived in New York and Washington, D.C. That was probably the hub for all the media. And then someone said, well, you know, the Commonweal, the Commonweal executive directors in Minnesota, I think, I'm like in Minnesota, and I didn't know this, they said, yeah, is there a Lakeville, Minnesota? <laughs> <laughs> and there is, and that's where we were able to first connect with Ellen Connick. Ellen has become a warm and joyful friend for our family here at St. Thomas. She has a master's in religion from Yale Divinity. She's on the advisory board for Liturgical Press. Um, but her work around Springtide Research Institute is what informs so much of her, of her reading and her writing. I'm going to pull out just a few quotes of an article that featured Ellen this week. And it was in Millennial. And I think it really, it describes what I've heard her speak about before. And interestingly enough, it's about hope. Her comments were, research gives me hope. I find that hope is actually the distinct factor. So many people are wringing their hands over the headline version of current trends around disaffiliation, unaffiliation, declining trust, and so on. But the majority of Gen Z and Gen Alpha self-identify as religious or spiritual. And Gen Z turns to religion for a sense of belonging more than any other generation. Because while young people may be doing religion differently than prior generations, those who are, are flourishing. In other words, their approach to religion is working. Religious young people express a greater well-being across a dozen different metrics than their non-religious peers. None of this is evident in those headlines, versions of disaffiliation and declining trust. Our religious expressions have shifted hundreds of times in the last 2,000 years, and they will shift again. In the meantime, these shifts are an opportunity for renewal. We'll bring Ellen up and please make note of your questions during the talk and then just get them up high enough that Izzier and I could grab them at the end. Welcome. Hi, uh, I have my phone here so I know what time we're keeping here. Uh, Julie said that I'm Ellen Koenig, I'm the executive director at Commonweal. Am I in the light still? Because I was kind of hoping, Father Aaron, you were glowing. No? OK. That's fine. Sweating. <laughs> Both. OK. Um, so my hope as moderator is really to just make these folks look good and make sure you get to hear everything that their expertise and insight can yield for the room. And I want these friends to be able to share freely and openly. But I'll give away my hand first, and in just one short sentence. Julie's already given you a preview of it. Perhaps controversially, or maybe not controversially at all, because I do work at Commonweal Magazine, I'm all for disagreement. And I think that's different than polarization. I'm sure that it is, and our panel will help define those terms. I'm all for disagreement that's rooted in charity and rigor and creative docility to the Holy Spirit. And my sense is that polarization can be overcome when we learn how to love our neighbor more than we love our argument, and when we learn or relearn the art of disagreement that's rooted ultimately in community. So what I mean to say here is disagreement that looks more like Peter and Paul than uh, Burr and Hamilton. Um, and I think our panel gets to explore that. So the way that this will work I'm going to introduce just one panelist at a time and ask them to respond to a prompt. That way you'll get to know everybody individually rather than try to remember their biographies as they share at different times. And the first question that I wanna ask is about polarization, of course. So I'm gonna ask this question to Monique. Monique Maddox is the president and CEO of Descendants Truth and Reconciliation Foundation. She is a descendant of the second largest sale of enslaved persons in America. Their enslavers were Jesuit priests who brought Catholicism to America in 1634. 
Today, she leads a nonprofit whose mission is to be a moral and intellectual leader in the pursuit of truth, racial hearing, healing, and the transformation of hearts and minds. So my question, Monique, and this will be similar to the question I ask our other panelists to weigh in on. We've heard Father Westman define polarization in five broad, broad contours. How do you understand polarization from your vantage point? And what is essential for beginning to overcome it? I think this is on. Yeah. Okay, great. So thanks, Ellen, for that. Um, being a descendant of a historic harm within our church is, uh, it requires a lot of patience. It requires a lot of uh, character, a lot of hope, a lot of spirit, a lot of Holy Spirit, I will say in order to face people who tell me that was so long ago. Our families didn't enslave your families. You weren't enslaved. And so I oftentimes encounter those people in a sense of peace, in a sense of love and compassion and for understanding. I listen to their perspective and I often say, I hear you. I, I verbally say, I hear you. And I want you to hear me as well. We come from different paths, but I, and our experiences are different. If you were to look at where I come from, and I look at where you come from, I believe there's commonality here. And so when our families uh, learned this history in 2016, we said, you were the priest who was teaching this faith to our families. Let us help you lead you to reconciliation. In one moment we said, you can't set the terms of your own penance. When I come to you as a priest and I have sinned, as your Father General has confessed that this was a sin against humanity, I don't get to set the terms of my penance. I come to you seeking reconciliation so that I could become whole in the church once again. Let us help you with this. Let us show a model to the world of what true reconciliation can look like. As hurtful as that was, as harmful as that was, let us help you. Let's walk that journey together to the cross. That is the only way we're going to get rid of polarization in this church, walking together. We said, listen to us. Follow our lead. We're not here to tear down the church. We love this church. This is the faith. Let's walk together and exemplify what reconciliation can look like so that our church is not polarizing, so that I can feel welcome when I walk in, so that I can believe what you as my priest is saying every Sunday. This is our faith. This is the faith that I believe. This is the faith that we all as Catholics believe. Let's be that example and let's show the world what that's like. Um, I will say I did have an opportunity to share this message with other groups. I was in England recently and shared this message with the Church of England. The Church of England is also dealing with their own ties to transatlantic chattel slavery. And the most profound thing I heard from those bishops there was, 
your model and showing your model to us is transforming our church. So we know that this is the way. This is the way, the truth, and the light. Let us be that model for everyone. Thank you, Monique. Jim, I want to ask you the next question. Actually, um, I'm hoping if there's a way for you to think through part of how Monique has begun this response, working together um, and modeling penance and forgiveness and reconciliation. Um, Jim is a survivor and thriver of childhood sexual abuse by a priest. He's a grassroots organizer for victim and survivor support, and he has worked with several dioceses and professional organizations representing victim survivor perspectives and supporting advocacy and outreach efforts. Jim grew up in Chicago, and he spent most of his professional life as a pathologist specializing in personal medicine for cancer patients here in the Midwest. Jim, what's polarization, and how do we begin overcoming it? Thank you. <clears throat> the theme, uh, Monique, that you hit upon um, that uh, kind of most resonates, right, is the notion of, uh, per, of that of having been harmed um, and then asking uh, for understanding of that. And even sometimes in the question, do you hear what I'm saying, um, <laughs> there's a lot of resistance, isn't there, friend? Uh, my uh, work uh, on, on this advisory board uh, really brings, uh, again, uh, my personal and my professional uh, perspective on how we address harm. And one of the things about um, the restorative justice practices, um, and I, I appreciate uh, Father Griffith for having uh, 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 given it a couple of bullet points, right, is uh, you need a person who has been harmed to share that. So there needs to be some willingness to hear that. The person who has done the harming, the organization, the culture that has done the harming, needs to want to be accountable. And in the triangle of the harmed, the person who did or where the harm came from, is also the community, the culture, the neighborhood, the church in which that occurred and in which those folks live and continue to want to participate and belong. Right? So I've always loved that triangle approach uh, to restorative justice. And from my perspective, it is very, very difficult. The more um, impactful the harm, the more sensitive the topic, the more difficult it is to even begin to uh, to broach that. And that oftentimes has nothing to do with my feelings about you. That may really have to do with your feelings about me. And I have to acknowledge that, but I also want to invite folks, don't we, into being open to that. Um, and so <clears throat> I think um, from a church perspective, um, there has historically been really three roads for folks who have been harmed in ways that I have been harmed, right? There is um, the justice system, there is the canonical system, and then there is the mental health or self-care system. And as I describe to folks, oftentimes those three systems are in parallel. They never intersect and they do not necessarily have a finish line or at least a finish line that you would like. And I think, Monique, this goes back to setting expectations both for ourselves and setting expectations for other folks. Um, and so I really, really appreciate uh, Father Aaron, your comment earlier uh, that really strikes upon the similarities of folks or the commonalities that we have. Um, and I think that particularly as Catholic people, right, to be able to, to fall back on our, to fall back on even that term that we are Catholic together, we are in church together, um, I think can be very helpful. Uh, but uh, again, I, 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 I think that it does require deep, deep listening and a real willingness. Uh, you know, to have that conversation. Um, so I am, uh, I am very, very uh, sensitive in my own personal and professional work 
about even sometimes the terms I use uh, and sometimes the language that I employ because don't we know that sometimes that itself is very, very, very triggering for folks. So yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, Jim. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Susan to respond next. Susan Mulherin holds a license in canon law from the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C., and a doctorate in canon law from the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross in Rome. And she's been serving as Chancellor for Canonical Affairs for the Archdiocese of St. Paul in Minneapolis since 2013, and her areas of canonical expertise include chancery practice, church governance, canonical processes, and jurisprudence related to sexual abuse and misconduct by clergy. Susan is a wife, mother, and advocate for restorative justice and other restorative practices to help address various harms experienced in the church. I think the question to you is the same, what is polarization and how can it be overcome? But I wonder if part of your response wants to address some of these systems that are already in place for harms when we begin to recognize them. Thank you. Is this on? Yeah. So how would I respond to to that, Jim's answer kind of sent me in this whole like cognitive spin. So I think I'll, I'll combine that with what I was prepared to say. And I'll first start with talking about, you know, my sort of vantage point um, at this. Um, you heard the, the CV there. Um, I have theological training. I have a doctorate in canon law. I've spent the last decade plus serving as a close advisor to the archbishop in this archdiocese and other church institutions. So I'm very much um, like a, an insider, an institutional insider. Um, and so I, um, I bring that perspective of that, that formal training, but also the um, kind of baptism by fire type training that, um, that I received through working with the leadership team here in this archdiocese over the past decade and I think pretty everyone's probably familiar with the journey that that we went through here and um, particularly about when, what Jim's comments got me started thinking about was um, um, as as you know sitting around a, a new person around that leadership table when everything started coming out in this archdiocese about the historical and ongoing harms that were being um, done, you know, on the part of, of church leaderships and the systems and everything. Um, uh, taking this intentional perspective of um, how do we, how do we turn from, from being institutionally minded to persons minded? And so, you know, as you know, you're, you're, I'm a lawyer representing the institution and we had to be very uh, strategic about setting aside we aren't here to defend the institution you know as the church we are here to to see the people who are who are wounded and harmed and and throughout the entire community of course the victims but everybody who is hurting in this process and and making sure that was guiding every decision that we made and being that victims first centered and that um process that was taken up by the entire leadership team at that time was continued um, is is born so many fruits in this local church one of them being I think this Institute for restorative justice and healing um, I know Archbishop Hebda is, is fully supportive of this and our restorative practices that we implement on a day-to-day -day basis um, as decisions are being made and things are being addressed um, at the leadership tables in the archdiocese and so that's where i was going to start my comments in terms of my um so you know I, I am a close advisor to the archbishop and and so i see i wanted to affirm uh, what father westman was describing in terms of polarization in the church because it's certainly alive and well in this um, local church as it is everywhere of course and you can imagine um working with the Archbishop, you know, seeing all his correspondence, sitting in on so many meetings, I have kind of a unique perspective to see all the people who are coming to him, wanting him to take their side, you know, or resolve this problem or address this wrong, tell that person they're wrong, tell them I'm right, or, you know, they're, um, and, and looking to him to, to, to stand up for the truth with a capital T. 
And, um, and, and I've got a lot of great things to say about Archbishop Hebda, but one of them is how collaborative he is. And so he sends these, these, the letters or whatever it is, the, the issue around his team. And he says, what, give me a proposal. What should we do? And so I want, and I, I, I do this and I know my colleagues do this because we, we talk about the importance of this sort of three-step process when you're um, trying to advise someone in the position of the archbishop, you know, as the pillar of unity in this local church, somebody who represents this church that means so much to so many people. You talk about identity, you know, how, you know, how close is the church wrapped up in our identity, but this three-step process of being, setting aside your personal thoughts and reactions or opinions about this person or that parish or this political issue or this teaching of the church, and, and doing that kind of checking yourself. You had, I wrote down the, the term that you talked about it, but sort of um, doing your own work. It's not about you, right? The presenting issue in front of you. <clears throat> Making sure that you're in that um, right frame of reference before you start coming up with ideas for what how the Archbishop should respond. And then the second would be grounding yourself in that sacred tradition, that group think that you called it. Um, it's so, when we look at what um, the, the depth and the breadth of our Catholic teachings, they're so centering and so grounding. I mean, I mean the entire entirety of them, right? The, the whole gamut and putting yourself in that place and thinking about the problem that's before you and drawing on that, on that reference. And then the third is looking at that the human beings in front of you and what they're expressing in terms of their experience. And there's, there's, there's always some sort of harm that's there, some sort of wound that's there. And it's, it's you, often it's multi, on multiple levels and from multiple people. And that, knowing that that is the real issue that, that needs to be addressed by leadership. So kind of getting in this serene point of view, having um, a, a really grounded place to come at it, and then looking at that human person and, and, and getting to that. And so when we're, we're in these meetings with Archbishop, or we're trying to write a letter um, responding to someone who's talking about something very painful, um, that, is, that is what we're seeking to do, is, is helping this person understand they've been seen and heard and recognized, and that they are loved and that they belong and that um and that the church is is there for them and they are they are part of it and just trying to break down this it's not you're outside and these type of things so that's um a very intentional approach that i know i have and others on the leadership team have and that's that's how do we overcome polarization leadership sets the tone and um it starts with um helping people coming to the table, not just seeing, okay, that's the enemy, that's the outsider. It's not like I'm here on Archbishop's side to defend the truth and to help you understand why you're wrong. We're coming to the meeting as what is the pain this person is experiencing and how can we bring Christ to this person? So. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, I'm going to do something really unfair now and that's that I'm going to ask Father Aaron a question he doesn't know is coming. But, uh, to, well, I did, I covered my bases by saying, we'll be flexible about exactly what I end up asking. So, Father Aaron, um, in your presentation, I think w one of the ways for understanding polarization in your presentation is to think of it as the intensification and solidification of groups. Just, and there's good reasons for groups, but when they intensify or solidify in certain ways, there's some bad, there's some bad news there. This panel, naturally is thinking about polarization and its impact when two groups uh, exist and one is harmed and maybe one is perpetuating harm. So can you help us think through what in your research or in your work on polarization helps address power dynamics, harm, and reconciliation? So thank you. That's a tough question. So I appreciate it. And uh, I wish I would have... Um, brought a notepad up here because I really appreciate everything that's being shared by, by the three of you. Um, I think it's really important to highlight that um, 
if there are these power dynamics going on, a great, great deal of sensitivity is necessary. Um, I put forth in my book a number of tools and practices that I think people can apply. So crossing over, curiosity, flexibility. The thing I end on is the, the virtue of prudence. And I highlight that, that sense of prudence because I don't think I am in any place to be able to tell somebody who's been harmed by another group that they should respond in any particular way. I think they have to, in prudence, really discern that for themselves. Um, and I was thinking about that as, as, as you folks were speaking about the different types of harm and thinking about how, just how sad that is and, and, and how, um, how intense that probably is for different folks. Um, so I appreciate that a lot. I would just like to hold up uh, an example of somebody who inspires me, who is, is part of a group that, that has been oppressed and um, has faced injustice and, and has decided in his own work and his own experience that he would like to try to overcome this, this, this sense of divide and, and injustice and, and, and polarization. And that would be the, the work of Daryl Davis, who, who I think many people are familiar with. D Davis is a, an African-American man and um, uh, also a musician. And the story of, of Davis in short is simply that he was playing at a bar and after playing music at a bar, a white man approached him and they started to talk. And as the story goes, as I've heard it, um, in the midst of that conversation, the white man was telling Davis how much he appreciated his music. And uh, in, in the middle of that conversation, the white man told Davis, a black man, that that he is a member of the Ku Klux Klan, and not only a member, but a high-ranking member of the Klan, and that he had never, ever engaged a black man before. So, I mean, going to the question, in, in that moment, I mean, it would be understandable that, that, that somebody would, in Davis's situation would walk away, uh, may, perhaps become very uncomfortable, maybe even become afraid. I mean, who, who knows, right? So it's difficult to say, well, what should have Davis done in that situation? Davis's response is just unbelievable and remarkable to me. He remained engaged. So he continued to talk to that person. He remained curious. He asked him questions. And then he sought to build a relationship with that particular person who ended up being open to the relationship as well. Well, because of his tremendous virtue and his ability to remain engaged in a, in a highly divisive and polarized situation where there was an imbalance in many ways because of the injustices that had been done, uh, that person decided to leave the clan forever. I mean, that is a remarkable story and experience. Well, well Davis takes it a, a step further, if you will, and he says that now my life's goal and mission is to attend clan rallies throughout the United States. Uh, and so he, he, he does this. I'm not sure if he's currently doing it now. I, I haven't seen anything recent on but basically he would attend rallies all over the United States. And we could imagine in those situations, I mean, he would hear every single uh, bad word possible and he, he would even have his life threatened but somehow he, he remained in that situation which is extraordinary and once in a while in the midst of all of the threats uh, there would be somebody who was interested in, in, in having a conversation with Davis and in his in a sense willingness to put himself out there to sacrifice perhaps even be a potential martyr in this situation over 200 people have left the clan because of Davis's willingness to try to overcome this sense of polarization. So I hold up Davis as, as an example, and I think that is an, expiring, an inspiring thing for me, knowing that I probably couldn't do something similar. And I think that's, that was a, a great answer, especially with no, no warning. Um, I, I appreciate it so much in part because I think it begins to bring us to the part of the conversation that I think we should think about next, which is the specific um, space of the church. The next panel will be about overcoming polarization in society. Um, what role does the church have in particular? Because I think we're thinking about individuals so far, the people who are willing to stand up and be um, proponents for for um, overcoming polarization or for engagement and conversation. What role does the church have? And I'm thinking in part about a, a point in your presentation, 40% of Catholics are blue and the other 40% are red. So that, you know, that makes us ripe for uh, doing the work or rolling up our sleeves. Um, but I also think the church has this long tradition of, you know, unity over uniformity. You know, we don't get to fire 
the priest if we don't like his homily. We, you know, there, there's no new, new church to set up down the block. So what tools do we have and what roles do we need to play? And I'll, I'll ask the group this question. So if anybody has an idea first, you can start. Yes, please. Um, when I was preparing for this panel, um, I went to the Vatican website and I did a, like a keyword search for the word polarization. And I was really struck by the fact that you don't see it in pretty much anything in materials until Pope Francis comes on the scene. And, and but he is a prolific commenter on polarization. You can see it is clearly an issue that is near and dear to his heart for many years. It's message after message after document, encyclical, it's it's everywhere and he's he's preaching on this. Um, and and he also directly connects his um, love of the synodal process to overcoming polarization. And I never really put those pieces together until I saw um, the word polarization and, and synodality like laid out right next to each other in those Google results. And so I, I was thinking a lot about that. And, um, you know, I know that that the, the synod process is itself become like a polarizing issue, unfortunately, ironically, I guess. Um, but, you know, because we, we can, we can. Um, but but what, when you think about, when you brush aside the, the, the threats that people feel from the synodal process and what it truly is about, it's that relationship building. It's not about we're going to come around the round table and we're all going to come to uniformity and opinion. Uh, or consensus, but we're going to have a human engagement and dialogue, and we're going to break down the barriers that would allow us to put you in the camp of being an enemy and, and bringing together and becoming the real body of Christ that we're called to be. So in terms of the tools, boy, I mean, that I think Pope Francis is, is, is showing us right there. That's, that's clearly his, his vision is that the synodal process would be a tool for that. I'll go next. I, I feel like good listening skills are key. <laughs> um, you have to be able and be open to listening to other people's perspectives and putting yourself in their shoes. Um, and I think back to when George Floyd was murdered here. I was in a different place in my, my own self, personally. My brother was terminally ill. I didn't even process what was happening here in my own city until later. And I saw George Floyd as my brother. He could have been my brother. When I put myself in that place of empathy, it changes the trajectory. I, I also believe we have to be, be willing to repent. Our church has to repent. We have to repent for the sins that we commit. If we're not open to listening, putting ourselves in others' places, in other people's places, and repenting for the things that we do, we won't overcome this divide. It's, it's really key. Putting yourself in a place that is uncomfortable is also important to being able to embrace people that don't look like you or don't have the same frame of reference that you do. And so we have some, some principles, and thank you, Father Aaron, for sharing a lot of them with us to, to go away and really reflect on when we leave here. Share this with everyone that you know. Share what you've learned today, because that helps to widen the circle of influence and make this something that doesn't just stay in this room, but also goes beyond where we are today. Ellen, I'll, um, I will uh, touch upon, I, I think, something, uh, Susan, that you said with regard to, you know, leadership or, you know, the shepherd and, you know, and we, the sheep. Um, and so I'll take some folks back to um, the, uh, the, the early 1990s um, in Chicago in the Archdiocese uh, when uh, Cardinal 
Um, and now his name is, thank you, Cardinal Bernadine. Um, uh, for example, in uh, set up uh, what really became a model uh, for many archdioceses about what it, what it looked like to have, for example, a victim outreach services. So that's a, a fairly remarkable leadership decision to make, but if nobody shows up at the door, then you don't, you're not in business. And so there then became a generation of folks who were able to stand up, make that difficult drive. During the cocktail hour when we separate out, I'll tell you about how that 45 minute drive downtown went for my brother, my mother and I. I realize we'll be in our own group over there, but I'll be glad to share. And, and so you have to, to show up. And so I am reminded, right, I am reminded as somebody who is a six foot white guy college educated with an MD and a professional, that I have a lot of agency. I have a lot of agency. So do I use that? And if I use that my agency for myself, am I also going to use it for other folks? And so Ellen, when I think about polarization, I think about how often do we indeed want to step into the experience of someone else? You, you mentioned it, Father Aaron, is empathy. It's one of my favorite words in the whole world, right? one of my favorite worlds, right? Are we willing to be able to do that? And so again, I do see oftentimes in the grassroots movements in individuals in individual parishes in, by the way, the life uh, that I found when I moved here in 2015. That's another great story for our cocktail hour. Um, it was, there was really a lot going on, and so there were really good leadership decisions, but again, you can make those leadership decisions and you can put people in the right place at the right time, and then you need the flock to show up. You need folks to say, there is indeed a need. Uh, I would like to share my story. I would like to support somebody, right, who is feeling the other in that. And I would just like to call out the archdiocese here as an example of how folks get that right. Not 100% of the time, but oftentimes get it right. And also again, to among the crowd here, remind ourselves again, what do we have, right? What, um, what opportunities within our society, within our culture, within our church do we have? Where do we stand? And then how do we use that agency? Um, because there are folks, again, who may not have that agency, who may seem to be on the other, who are very easy to place into their own category, right? Uh, and that only furthers not only polarization, but it also really we deny ourselves the opportunity to to be a brother or a sister in Christ um, to that person. So I would I would put forth uh, two possibilities here that I think um, could really be utilized at the parish level, uh, also at within university faculties, and um, I, I think they could be um, in with, within religious communities and or dioceses as well with presbyterates. And I have heard of these working really well and experienced them for myself. The first is I, I actually think the model of having panels is a really good thing to do. So it, we probably are very much aware within the church of, of some of the various tensions and divisions that are existing at this time, uh, sometimes around the liturgy. Uh, in other ways, you know, we are 40%, 40% uh, within the church uh, uh, politically. There's also a lot of generational divides within the church, especially within presbyterates. And my, my biggest sorrow in the midst of that is that we are not finding as many venues as I think we could to just talk about those things. And I think, take for instance, the complicated situation of immigration and how it affects the church. The church is right in the heart of it in many ways. If you put together a panel with five or six people on the theme of immigration, you brought somebody who is in the United States without papers, you brought somebody who was uh, brought here when they were a young person, perhaps two or three years old, and now have grown up in the United States, you bring somebody who lives on the border, you bring in somebody who tries to enforce the border, you bring in somebody who's a politician who has to think about immigration, and allow them all to simply speak together on the same panel together, but to give in a sense, uh, you know, some, some protocols, some, some tools ahead of time, and so there's some agreement about respectfulness and, and civility. 
I've seen panels like that and they're extraordinary. And I walk away just saying like, you know, again, how much I didn't know about that subject, but the, the way in which people's stories, oh my gosh, the things that people have been through. And that's, th those stories, they, af they affect why a person thinks the way they do about an issue like immigration. So that, that would be the first example. Uh, the second example uh, along uh, with panels, um, and now it's escaping my mind, so I'll just, I'll just leave it with the panels at this point, okay? okay. Thank you. If you remember it, just chime in. Great. Um, I want to give the chance for the everybody gathered here, and I, I don't think we're taking questions online, are we, Father Dan? Okay, no problem. Um, I bet you all have very good questions online, and we'll hear them someday, you know? Um, bring them up in your communities. So uh, we're going to have some time for all of you to participate and pose questions. Um, and so right now, I just want to take a minute of quiet to digest some of what you've heard, both in Father Aaron's opening remarks and on the panel. After a minute, feel free to jot things down. And then while the questions are coming up, I'll see if this group has any questions for each other to begin. And then we'll also take some questions from all of you if, if a few emerge. So first, just a little bit of silence. Um, I have a question for Susan. So Susan, what is something uh, that folks don't know that you would like to share about the work that you do? Because as you've shared, you are in the inner circle. What do you want to know, Jeff? <laughs> <laughs> something that has, some, or something that has surprised you uh, in your work. Well, boy, okay. Um, something that the people don't know or has surprised me i mean every <laughs> every day is is a full of surprises right you know um I, I feel like i joke about how like i only get if something gets to my desk it's a hard question i only get hard questions <laughs> and it's amazing to me the um the breadth of of the challenges that are out there you know when, when we think of what the the church is it's not just going in um, to a parish and having mass and then you leave the church is a society the church is our world our family our identity and it's the complexity of issues that are involved are extraordinary um and and so trying to again advise someone like archbishop hebda i mean think about the bishop's job it's it's like an impossible job you know, he's the he's the pillar of unity is one of the titles of a of a bishop. That's his role, um, and and to model that that Christ like behavior for everyone and to be everything to everyone. And then you see that on a, the next level with your parish priests. And so I, I see a lot of that. I see the 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 struggles with human vulnerability and how much that. <laughs> I was gonna say ways on the church, but really that is the church, our human vulnerability, you know, um, and and how much that affects the goings on of the church. Not just, you know, it's not it's it's the faithful, yes, it's the clergy, it's everybody, and how human this church is, and how much we need that uh, guidance of the Holy Spirit. Maybe you know, follow follow Jesus. I mean, we, we all know this. Yes, 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 of course, that's what we do. But but to make sure, again, when I, I get talked about that, that, that process that, that I described, I mean, that's, that's very real. And making sure we're, what spirits are we following? I used to get spiritual direction from this um, religious sister, and she would always ask me, who's driving your bus? Who's, what spirit is driving your bus? You know, and um, are, you, are you discerning and following the Holy Spirit or you know, another spirit who's trying to lead you the other direction. And we all know that we're always, that spirit is there always trying to take us this way. And that's certainly behind polarization. So I think I answered your question to how human. But the church is still here. Thank I have a you. question for Father Aaron. Father Aaron, in your research and in your studies, how much would you say polarization has uh, impacted the number of people sitting in the pews 
And are we seeing a turn of that and maybe some advice on how to get the pews full again? So um, one of the lacuna that I have uh, seen in my research is that there isn't really a deep dive into the, the soci sociological makeup of the church at this point. So there's a lot of research on uh, political polarization and partisan polarization and even cultural polarization at large. One of the things that has been missing is somebody who's you know, done the hard work to take a look at the church and say, you know, what are people actually thinking and what are they actually feeling? And so this is a little bit of a shout out to an upcoming resource that I'm looking very forward to reading and, and hopefully reviewing. And it's called, I think it's called A Church at the Crossroads. And it's, it's, it's a book written by a number of sociologists who I think more or less are Catholic, but who do a deep dive investigating just how polarized is the church. Uh, what are people thinking within the pews and how are they being affected by the polarization that exists? So I think the best way to answer that question at this point is to say we really need more rich resources to try to understand what is actually taking place. Along with that, I think I do have a lot of anecdotal research um, that suggests that I'm not so sure if people are, are, are affected by or experiencing polarization and, and therefore they're leaving the church. I just think they're finding a place where they feel at home and comfortable. And in that way, I think they're choosing in some ways not to then engage with the various subcultures and subgroups that exist within the church. And so some of the things that I would you know, love to recommend for people to consider would be, you know, if you're very comfortable in a parish and it's, let's just say, a, a parish that maybe tends to be a little more progressive leaning, once a month or once a quarter, Take your family to a place that, in, we all know these places exist within dioceses that might be a little bit more traditional. Maybe they're even celebrating the Latin Mass. So, and, and go relate to those people and just listen to them and have coffee with them and, and try to understand who they are. So again, kind of taking these subgroups that exist within the church and then inviting ourselves to cross over and experience the differences that exist within the church, I think could be one thing that would be very helpful for us. I have a couple of questions here from from the group. Um, one is for you, Father Aaron, and the next is for the group. I'll ask them both because we have probably five minutes left. Does that sound right? Um, so you can start us off and others can answer one or the other. So the first question, Father Westman, you spoke about the power of the Eucharist to bring people together, yet the church bars non-Catholics from the table. Does this undermine your message? Is it alienating to attend a feast and be denied the food? And our second question is, what are some strategies for withdrawing from a heated conversation that is starting to feel dangerous? Would you like me to try to address the Eucharist yeah, If you want to, you can like take a minute to think if you want to answer something, or you can get us started. So I gave a retreat on this theme. So I, I just say that at the outset, I'm not really smart that I just have an answer available to me. I actually thought about this in the context of a retreat. So um, it, it, is a, it is a source of tension that I think we all encounter, especially as priests. We have funerals, we have weddings, and we, every, we say, everybody's welcome to come, and, but only so far, right? So, and, and it, we all know that to be the case, and we feel that in our families. So it's very much a real reality and a very true reality for us. And um, there is no easy way to say that this is necessarily the best way to respond. It's mm -hmm. just that this is in the church's kind of history, tradition, and practice, kind of how the church has tried to respond. And so knowing that we don't have like a completely open communion, as mm -hmm. some might do with other uh, denominations, ours is more or less closed for a lack of better theological distinction, I have actually invited people to say, uh, create intermediary tables that have different rules that allow more people to come. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully those intermediary tables will allow full participation in the great table of the Lord's mm -hmm. Supper. And so what I mean by that is, you know, we all have the ability to say who's gonna be in and who's gonna be out in the tables of our friends and our families and the groups that we associate with. So we might actually have closed communion amongst the circles of people we relate to. But I would invite us to adjust those rules 
to allow people, more people to come that maybe wouldn't necessarily be invited to our particular table. And then in that moment, we can again build the relationships and hopefully through the process of understanding who we are as a people of faith and what we believe, folks might slowly deepen communion. And I think that's the most important thing. It's kind of, it's not an, an all or none, but it's a so, slow process as the Second Vatican Council talks about of slowly deepening communion as much as that is possible so that we might have full communion one day. Maybe not here, but perhaps uh, in the afterlife. I think that's really helpful. Would somebody else like to take up withdrawing from a conversation that's beginning to feel dangerous? I like to introduce prayer at that time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so let's, let's pray about this. Mm. Let's join hands. And when we, when we center it around prayer, it starts, sort of disarms people from the heat and say, we may not agree, but let's pray together so that we can come to some commonality on this issue. Mm -hmm. I'm a fan uh, in what I think you're describing as kind of conflict management. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a big fan of silence. Um, I find that uh, also disarming sometimes, <laughs> although I like your, I like your approach. Uh, Monique, I, 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 found, I, I do, I find silence. And I also find that notion of kind of reflecting back what I just heard, right? So particularly if someone has said something that I think is outrageous, or I strongly disagree with, or mm -hmm. I find personally offensive. Mm -hmm. um, and I try to say that back in the tone of voice that, for example, I'm using right now. So that it perhaps sounds less emotionally charged, but the content is mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Whatever the frustration or anger or blame or quite frankly flat out, you know, mean thing <laughs> that, that, that may be, you know, kind of causing to escalate. And I also think that it is really important um, to say, um, thank you, I am going to leave or step mm -hmm. away, or I, I now have a new response, thank you, I am going to go pray. Mm -hmm. And if you're feeling particularly pointed, you might say, for, for you. you. <laughs> Perhaps I'll say that last part yeah. silently, yes. but, but again, I, I think there is something about um, approaching folks, per, again, and we've all been part of those conversations at home uh, with our family. Um, I really, I, I have so much, so much more insight now into that 40-40 Catholic red and blue mm -hmm. um, into my own family, right? And so this occasionally comes up for us. Uh, around things, and so um, uh, so again, thank you for sharing that. That's that's my approach, Ellen. I think that's wonderful. Um, I think prayer and silence is as is, is, as good a spot as we can leave this conversation, actually. Um, and uh, lest anybody be. Uh, you know, disappointed. There's another panel to come, and so there'll be plenty of time for more questions. I have like seven that I didn't get to ask, so they might make their way up in note cards. But first, um, I want to just uh, invite you all to thank um, our amazing panelists. Thank you, Monique and Susan, Father Aaron and Jim. And thank you all for your time and attention. Thank you to uh, Ellen and our wonderful panelists for the great uh, conversation. Um, we're going to take uh, a five minute break. Uh, there's bathrooms over here to the right. There's coffee and water. Some of you have that. Uh, there's also drink tickets for the, for the happy hour, the cocktail hour, the gym reference. So make sure you get yourself a drink ticket if you plan to use it. Uh, and so what we'll do is we'll take five. We'll come back at about uh, 22 and we'll have our, our next panel. But I want to thank just the, the, the openness, the wisdom. I want to thank Ellen for her, her thoughtful approach to the panel. And I want to thank those who, who wrote down questions. Uh, thank you all and we'll see you back in, in five. Thank you guys.